they've announced uh, two special prizes from the Fundamental Physics Foundation, a special prize that's run by um, a guy, a Russian billionaire called Yuri Milner. The amount of money that's awarded for these prizes is basically the largest amount of money that's ever awarded for a physics prize. It's a three million dollars. So that completely dwarfs what the Nobel Prize winners get or, or Templeton Prize winners. They've announced two special prizes today, one to Stephen Hawking and the other to uh, seven CERN physicists. It's a committee that basically decides who's going to get the prize for the subsequent year and that's made up of previous prize winners. So there's a bunch of people that got it in the summer and they've uh, and basically they've got together and they've decided like who's going to get the prize next year. Well they've decided who's going to be nominated but also they're allowed to make a little special recommendation in certain cases where it's not part of the main prize but they just decide that somebody deserves a special prize and it's for the same amount of money and that's the, those are the announcements that have been made today along with nominations for next year's prize. Well CERN obviously speaks for itself for what's, what they've achieved at the, at the LHC. Hawking, well we all, we've all heard of him, he's one of the most famous physicists alive today if not the most famous. But specifically he's won the prize for his contributions to black hole physics and, uh, and quantum gravity. So academically clearly he deserves it. Back in the 60s and 70s Hawking did some fantastic work uh, and it's completely revolutionised how, how we understand black holes. And similarly his ideas about quantum gravity in the universe are, are really important. I do think that the prize itself $3 million, Hawking doesn't really need that money, actually. He's a millionaire anyway. And sometimes, you know, if somebody's going to throw this amount of money, as Milner is, at physics, then I would probably prefer he, it was spread out more evenly and it was used to fund younger researchers rather than just giving a pat on the back to the, uh, the really famous guys. I suppose there is an argument which says that, that it raises the profile of physics and that's got to be a good thing as well. But certainly from an academic point of view, I think Hawking is a worthy recipient. So, so Hawking basically has, has he's had three main scientific achievements in his, in, his, in his career. So the first of these is his singularity theorems. So what Hawking and, and, uh, and Roger Penrose uh, realised is that if you assume matter has some generic properties that, are very, that every type of matter, sensible type of matter that we see in nature uh, has, then you can prove that singularities exist within Einstein's theory of relativity. So a singularity is, is a region of infinite density and infinite space-time curvature where all your field equations break down. What they're telling us here is that Einstein's theory actually has its limitations, that it predicts its own, own downfall. The second thing, another place where you get these singularities, of course, is, is in black holes. At the centre of a black hole, a star collapses and it forms one of these objects. People often say black holes are, are black, that literally no light can escape because the gravitational field is so strong. But what Hawking realised, and this is probably his greatest achievement, was that when you apply quantum mechanics, particularly to the event horizon of a black hole, then you can get particle creation on sort of either side of the event horizon. So you have a particle and an antiparticle literally pop into existence. So the particle escapes and the antiparticle falls into the black hole. And this process allows a black hole to actually radiate, to actually give off radiation, which as you said, is Hawking radiation. And a black hole will actually, you know, it, it can radiate away as a result of this process. Although we still don't understand the end point of that, that evaporation process. We know that it will radiate, 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 but what happens at the end, actually, when it gets to a very small planking sized black hole, we, we don't really know what happens there. Tony, I thought black holes have never actually been observed, so how do we know Hawking radiation is correct? So we don't know Hawking radiation is correct, but this is one of the points of the prize. So th there is no experimental proof of Hawking radiation. Um, it's possible that we might produce a black hole at the LHC, and if, if we did, then that could, that we detect the Hawking radiation, that's how we would know it was there. And then we'd say, okay, right, give Hawking the Nobel Prize, right? As, and maybe some other people too for, for related work. But th there's no proof of this at the moment, and certainly you ain't gonna detect the Hawking radiation from the black hole at the center of the galaxy if there is one there. So the question is, how's Hawking ever gonna get a prize for this remarkable work? Well, this is the point of this prize that, and I think nowadays, theoretical physics has advanced so much and the gap between 
theory and experiment in terms of time scale is so large that I, I would be surprised if after the, after the discovery of the Higgs that any theorist will get a Nobel Prize again, certainly in this area of cosmology, quantum gravity, simply because the gap between theory and experiments is becoming so large. So that's one of the good things about this prize, it fills that gap. It doesn't demand that there has to be experimental proof. It's just that the, the community itself has accepted that black holes will give off Hawking radiation. So the third discovery of, of Hawking, or I say, I, I, I'm, I'm loath to say discovery because these, these are not proven, these, these things yet, but they're great ideas. And the third thing that, that Hawking introduced was the idea of the wave function of the universe. In quantum mechanics, everything is described by wave functions. So, you know, you don't have any sort of definite state anymore. Everything's just a, a mixture of different possible scenarios. Hawking applied this idea to the universe. And in particular, he's been able to do away with the singularity at the beginning of the universe. And what he did was, he advocates, well, it's in his book here, what's called Euclidean quantum gravity. This is a pretty heavy going book. Um, I know that some of Hawking's students have to read this before they do anything else. They have to read through the whole book. Euclidean, the Euclidean bit of that means you go to imaginary time. So you get rid of real time and you go to imaginary time. And you describe physics like that. And what that does is, you can have a scenario where when you go back in imaginary time, the, the universe just closes off. You have no boundary. So there's no initial point in time, you can't define that, it just closes off. When you say imaginary time, do you mean like a time where there's Cinderella, or do you mean imaginary in terms of I, a number that doesn't exist? Yeah, a number that doesn't exist. Um, yeah, I mean the, in terms of the imaginary number, yeah, exactly. So you'd basically, you go from time as in real time to I times that. You can have a, an entire process which would happen instantaneously in real time. But actually, when you go to imaginary, it's actually moving around in imaginary time. This process is happening in imaginary time. So that's where it's going on. And you can actually make predictions that, are, that can be verified based on all these little dynamics, but in the imaginary time plane, if you like. So you can actually go to, you can, some ideas, you can even go to complex time, where you have a real component and an imaginary component. I mean, you can really extend the notion of time in this way. One of the things that Hawking's done recently where he's applied these ideas of Euclidean quantum gravity to is, is to the acceleration of the universe. So we know that the universe is expanding quicker and quicker today. And uh, normally we attribute that to uh, a positive cosmological constant, a positive energy of the vacuum. Now what Hawking is claiming is that actually you can get the same effect but from a negative cosmological constant, a negative energy of the vacuum. Now that doesn't normally happen, right? That's not what normally happens. Negative cosmological constant behaves very, very differently. You, typically the universe would just crunch. Um, but he's saying that actually you can get this cosmic acceleration out of it, and that's really weird. Well, I know that he does his calculations in his head, which I just find just astonishing, absolutely astonishing. I mean, I've got, so there'll be a pile on here of, of just, uh, just calculations. Like, this is a 15-page, you know, calculation. You know, he, do, he does that in his head. It's unbelievable. I just find it astonishing. So, so Hawking, obviously, you know, he's this, this great guy and, and astonishing physicist. But a friend of mine was behind him in the queue for tea once at, um, in Cambridge. He's like, oh, yeah, that's Stephen Hawking in front of me in the queue. That's pretty, pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, I wonder what he's going to say, right? You know, thinking that... So Hawking gets to the front of the queue, and he's, he's sort of, oh, he's going to say something, you know. And, uh, and then he said, um, tea, please. So that was all a bit disappointing for... Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what I expected, some sort of dramatic uh, insight into, you know, the physics of tea or something, but he just got tea, please. So uh, he, he is a normal person as well, I think is the point. <laughs>